Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Story Church. My name is Rolando, and today I have the honor of introducing you to today's guest speaker. Today we're kicking off a brand new message series at the Story called The Seven Deadly Sins, Slamming the Doors to Darkness. We're going to spend the next seven weeks digging deeper into this historical teaching created by a group of theologians in a Jerusalem monastery over 1,600 years ago to prepare you and your loved ones to withstand attacks from our spiritual enemy. To kick off the series today, we have an incredible guest speaker. He's been a close friend of mine for many years, and he's a personal, professional, and spiritual mentor to many others. He's also an entrepreneur who owns a local fitness gym, mentors business leaders across the country, and serves as a spiritual leader at a large church here in town, all while raising three amazing children alongside his wonderful wife and business partner, Ashley. Some gentlemen in the house might recognize him from the time he taught at our Leading Men Ministry. And on a more personal note, he's the reason I met my wife of two and a half years, Ariana, and he actually officiated our wedding ceremony. But most importantly, he has one of the most amazing hearts for God and people that I've ever seen. I know that today he's going to bless you with a powerful message. So without further ado, Please join me in giving a warm story welcome to today's guest speaker, Terry Williams. What's up, Story Fam? Good morning. So I'll just go ahead and lead with this. I'm a little bit crazy. Thank you for welcoming your crazy cousin to come. I'm just planted at a local church right up the street, and it's so good to be in the house with you guys. I love what the story is about, what the story is up to. Love me some Pastor Eric. It's my kind of dude, Astros fan, great husband, great father, and a person who really studies the word and gets curious about what's in it and how I can share it with others. Um, I got to address this little elephant in the room. Rolando was talking about how he met his wife and how I may or may not have had a little a bit of a part to play in that. So, and I'll weave the introduction of who I am into this story. So my wife, Ashley, and I uh, founded The League. It's a local gym here in town. It's been around for almost eight and a half years. And I don't say this at all to pitch to you our services and what we do. In fact, this message is gonna get into why we don't go grasping for gain. We're gonna deal with the issue of greed today. But to give you a little bit of our background, we have this gym. And it's not about just getting the reps inside the gym. We give people what we call reps outside the gym through a platform that gives help with not just physical fitness, but we do mental fitness and emotional fitness and relational fitness. And for anybody who has ears to hear, we also do spiritual fitness. And uh, we had this photo on the gym's Instagram page, just telling the story about the league and what we do and inviting people to come out. And Ariana happened to be featured in this photo. And I just remember Rolando sliding into my DMs, not hers for the record, and just being like, who is that girl? And we made the introduction happen, and I happened to know him as like a great dude, just a solid guy with the best of intentions, and was like, you should really give this guy time of day. He's actually incredible. Little did I know they would end up getting married, serving together on the staff here of your great church. It's just so incredible to see how we can step out of the context that tradition gives us and really do life with people and enter the more vulnerable spaces and see brand new things come to life because of it. And that's what I find the story church to be. I, what I like about the story is what it's not. The story is not closed-minded Christianity. You guys had a, a message a couple weeks ago about God's preferred pronouns. You had a message about climate change. Like these are hot button issues, right? These are the kind of issues that if you were just scared of like, oh, oh, oh we don't bring up anything that would have been okay until it was brought into a politicized context and now people's feelings are gonna be hurt. The story is not closed-minded Christianity. The story is not country club Christianity, asking questions about who is or is not allowed into the building or isn't good enough. The story is not cute Christianity. Girl, I gotta get my outfit right before I go to church today. <laughs> story fam comes as they are. What I do love about the story is what it is. The story is what I find to be curious Christianity. You know, one thing that I've learned is that Wisdom can only find us in the place of curiosity. God can't heal what we won't reveal. If you get an answer to a question that you weren't asking for, it feels like an attack, right? 
God's trying his hardest to give you a good thing, to resource you with tools, to advance you further, faster. You can't even receive the blessing because it goes against a preconditioned ideology, right? I'm committed to this game plan for my life. God's like, I want to advance you. I want to do this for you. Nope, I'm committed. But if you get curious and you ask and you say, what if my way isn't the best way? Maybe there's another way. God's going to be like, here's my way, and it's awesome. So today we're talking about greed. As Rolando talked about in the introduction, uh, this is the kickoff for a seven-week series on the seven deadly sins. I want to welcome in our online community as well as this service is streaming online. Hey, friends, whether you're in this room or the living room, there's always space for you uh, in this house. And we're talking about greed today to kick off this series. I love how uh, the, the tagline to this series is slamming the doors on darkness because Seven deadly sins, the reason there is this list of seven deadly sins is it was believed by the early church that even though all sin is equal, all sin is a problem, we want to purge our life of all sin, we want to have a heart of repentance, right? There are certain sins that seem to be these doorways to a really dark place, right? There's the open palm slapping of somebody that's clearly assault, but then there's the insidious mindset of like carrying hatred in your heart toward another human that really should be dealt with. You didn't see it coming, but you feel it. You know it's there. Nobody else could judge you or criticize it or even see it. But there's this poison in the human heart. So the seven deadly sins are rooted in that mindset. Now, let's give some context. Let's give some history here. First, I'll list them out, and then I'll tell you how they came about. Pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, wrath, and sloth. Or in today's terms, pride, let's call it arrogance. Lust, you already know what it is. Envy, let's call that jealousy. Gluttony, this could be a certain type of greed, right? For things uh, like too much food, maybe. Wrath, let's call that anger. Sloth, let's call that laziness, right? But greed, let's just call it what it is. Greed is greed, right? And we're going to really break it down. Instead of giving it a nickname today, we're going to explore the underpinnings of it. But first, a little uh, history from the early church. So it's important to note that You can thumb all through your Bible and you will not find a list of the seven deadly sins, okay? So you'll find the nine fruits of the spirit. You'll find the 10 commandments. You'll find the 12 disciples. You won't find the seven deadly sins. Here's the reason why. The Bible, and this is the reason why it's so historically defensible in apologetics, has its accuracy because of the proximity and time in which it was written and the chronology of Christ's life. So within that first century, you have Paul on the ground taking notes, right? For hundred years after Christ's death, you have the early church starting to get curious. And I love this because again, wisdom finds us when we're curious. And they're owning that all sin is bad, but they're saying there's certain sins that appear to be doorways to darkness. There's certain sins that are insidious and creepy and will just slide right into our life without manifesting in our actions and our words and our deeds. Lust can be hidden in our hearts. Greed can be hidden in our hearts. Anger can be hidden in our hearts until all of a sudden we pop off, explode, and now it's exposed for all to see. So in the fourth century, uh, a Christian ascetic by the name of Evagrius Ponticus writes down a list of eight things that he believes to be doorways to darkness. Then his understudy in the fifth century, Cassius, says, oh, I don't know, maybe there's just seven things. And then that was later solidified uh, by Pope Gregory I in the sixth century, who says, here it is, official list, seven deadly sins. Now, what we're doing in this series is we're taking a look at these things and we're just getting curious. We're asking some questions. We're getting real close to this thing and saying, I can't fight this thing if I don't wanna address this thing. God can't heal what I won't reveal. I'd rather get real and say, I see these insidious things creeping up somewhere in my heart, in my life, and I'm gonna bring them in close where it's not so heavy to try to lift them. And I'm gonna take a good look and look them in the eye without fear and say, how am I gonna deal with you and how will God help me to rid my life of you? Let's highlight greed. Let's define it first. Let's get real clear on what greed is. There's a definition that'll come up on your screens. Um, Greed is defined as an intense, selfish desire for more of something than is needed. I like that word something. We'll talk about why. And then I love this second definition, the self-serving desire for something such as wealth, power, or food. Notice in that first definition, it didn't mention money not once. It's interesting because we think of greed and we think we go right to money in our minds. We think about that evil villain from the Netflix documentary that ran a Ponzi scheme and swindled people out of billions of dollars. And you're like cheering to see him go to jail. 
And then we don't deal with the issue of greed in our own heart because it's shrouded. It's wearing a mask. Oh, it's just ambition. It's just well-meaning. I just want to, you know, have more to do more for other people. And it's actually greed. Just want that promotion because, you know, I want to advance and my, you know, I want to honor the degree that I earned and I want to provide better for my family. And it's like, bro, you want a boat. (sighs) Notice that this isn't just about money, though. I love that the word something, more of something than is needed, more of prestige than is needed, more of power than is needed, more of having people agree with me to, you know, scratch my ego because it itches sometimes than is needed. When we live a life resigned to greed, what we end up doing is we fall into one of two camps. There's two fundamental belief systems around greed. Either I believe that there isn't enough out there And I have this mentality that drives me to just claw, fight, skit, cream, uh, uh, fight, kick, and scream, do whatever I got to do to grasp for gain. Because like, Lord knows there ain't enough out here. I got to get what's mine, defend and protect it, hold it tightly. Or the more malicious belief pattern that there is enough for everyone, sure. But I'm clever. I'm conniving. I'm cunning. I can slide right in there. I can take what's theirs and I can call it my own. But in either way, whether it's expressed or unexpressed, whether it manifests itself in your actions and words or just lives in your thoughts and your heart, it's greed. You gotta call it what it is. I think about these seven deadly sins. I think about lust. I think about anger. I think about laziness. I think about pride. And I have this question, and I'm not posing it to you as like a heavy theological truth. I'm posing it to you as something I've gotten curious about in my pastoral experience. And it's this, for all that fruit, for all those seven, for all that fruit is greed the root. Lust is clearly greed for something that does not belong to you. Pride is the greed that arrogance places us in when our opinion becomes an identity to defend and protect at all costs. Anger is greed for needing to be heard and understood. No, you're not getting it. So I'm gonna say it louder and more intensely and I'm gonna make you feel my wrath. And if you still don't get it, I'm gonna go do something terrible to make you hurt because ultimately I just wanna break you at this point. If I feel like I lost, I gotta get my win somewhere. It's all greed. Greed creeps right in and you never see it coming. I think about how, and I just, I kind of laugh to myself even sharing this example because I'm such a dad, right? But I love mowing my lawn. Like that's my time for like processing my thoughts, feeling my feelings. It's like almost meditative. It's really dope. So I was mowing my lawn one day and I was thinking about how these insidious things that come into the human heart that are elephants in the room and have to be dealt with, but we prefer not to talk about are a whole lot like the weeds that can pop up in a lawn. Like I've never, ever seen a baby weed growing and been like, oh man, it's come, here it comes. I got, you know what? I'm gonna get out there today, solve this for tomorrow. It's like you have no weeds and your lawn is pristine. And then all of a sudden you have a two foot monster and you're like, jeez. And then you have all these big complicated questions for how you're gonna get rid of it, right? It gets awkward because if you just take a weed whacker and go whack it, let one of the dads in here say, amen. That thing is gonna shoot seeds everywhere and you have a bigger weed problem. And if you try to pull it, but you don't get all the roots, you're gonna have a bigger weed problem because it only reproduces itself. How do you get that thing out of there? I wanna say in accountability before we explore how we get rid of that, to my friends, maybe some of them are here today, maybe some are watching online, in communities such as the atheist, agnostic, or cautiously Christian curious community, I would say to those who don't lean into the church because they see greed in the church, that I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry about what we made it. The church seeks to bring in finances, to pour out finances, to do awesome things in mission work, in community building. I'm so sorry for what it looks like. And I'm so sorry for miscarried motives. I'm so sorry for the terrible headlines in the news lately that clearly show Christians miscarrying their callings. And my appeal to my friends in these communities would be this. Please forgive the God seekers and don't get that confused with the goodness of God. Please don't blame the fans. The world champ's pretty good. 
It's this really cool scripture on greed in Proverbs. It's Proverbs 11, 24. And I'll start with this NIV um, translation, which shows up on your screens. And then I'm going to have a little fun, read it from some different angles. This one's pretty cool. So Proverbs 11, 24 says in the NIV version, one person gives freely yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. Let's talk about greed in the church. Woo, it's going to get awkward up in here. It's real, it's all fun and games when we take the first half of that scripture. And we're preaching truth when we do it. It's real, it's in scriptures right there. Book of Proverbs, it literally says, one person gives freely yet gains even more. We can make this transactional, right? But if we kill it there at the colon, we have sacrificed a greater truth. Hey, man, if you give to our giving campaign, our building campaign, God's going to bless you in tremendous ways. We turn this thing into like I'm giving to get, right? That second half of it says here in the NIV, another withholds unduly but comes to poverty. Big, 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 big truth there. Ouch. What do I have that I'm holding that I'm not allowing to flow through me into somebody else's life? And what's connected to that? There's a blessing connected to one, but there's a heck of a burden connected to the other. And I think about my kids, right? I have a really generous kid. I have one, we have three amazing kids, but one of them is like, he gets really excited about what he can share. And so uh, I give him a piece of candy one day. We're about to go outside and play with one of the neighbor's kids. And I give him a piece of candy, but then there's a second piece of candy as well. And it's like, give this to your brother before we go outside. Yeah, sure, dad, here you go. Hooks up his brother, we're good. So now I'm gonna put this joker to the test. I give him another piece of candy. I say, when we meet up with your buddy, I want you to give him this piece of candy. Now the narrative changes in my man's heart because he's like, oh, we're stepping outside the house. He doesn't know the covenant I have with my father in there. Hi, Christian, how we show up outside of Sundays. And, <laughs> and he decides to get real clever. Like he's not gonna give his buddy this piece of candy, but he's not necessarily gonna say that. And he might even make some hand gestures that kind of sell it to dad, like he might've given it away, but we're not quite sure. <laughs> he's gonna do whatever he needs to do to get that piece of candy. His heart is not bent on greed. His heart is bent on generosity. He gave it to his brother. I've seen him do it before. But this biblical principle is so true because he could have put himself in a position of wealth, so to speak, by being a giver. Because anything I give to him, I'm trying to give through him. The heart of the father towards us is the same. What he gives to you, he's trying to give through you. If we don't even ask who we can bless with what we've been blessed with, God's looking at that like, man, I know what I can entrust to you if I can see what I can trust you with. And if we withhold unduly, we got candy poverty. Daddy's like not dishing candy to you. We can shut down Halloween, bring it indoors, boys, if you're not going to be a blessing to others. But if my man was like, yeah, I'll give it to the neighbor's kid too. Matter of fact, dad, you got more candy? I met a new friend down at the park. I think she deserves a piece of bubble gum. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna give her bubble gum and you a bubble gum. Thank you so much. I love the generosity in your heart. I see I can trust you with this. Let's read that same scripture from a couple other applications. This is what it says in the KJV version, uh, in case you're into old English uh, language. There is that scattereth and yet increaseth. There is that withholdeth more than is meat, but tendeth to poverty. This is from the um, NLT version, New Living Translation. Give freely, become more wealthy. Be stingy, lose everything. Wow, that was clear. Uh, <laughs> The message translation. What I love about the message translation is that it takes the early writings and teachings of the Bible and it just asks the really big question, how would we say this today? Glad you asked. Here's where we land on that. The message version says, Proverbs eleven twenty four: the world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. Friends, it is true that we are blessed when we choose to be a blessing, but that is not a transactional or limited truth. It's not limited to what your accountant would tell you, right? And, and connecting it to generosity, fun story, my wife and I, we meet with a financial advisor and it was hilarious how one time she was like, and clearly not a believer and with respect to her worldview, she says, you know, you guys would be doing a lot better financially if you weren't giving 10% of everything you're earning to that church place. Like, what are you doing? 
And we had to literally explain, like, you don't even understand how much our life has been blessed and new doors have been opened, new opportunities have come because we're honoring that peace in obedience. And just to clear and qualify that, I didn't even tell that story in the previous service. It's not about that. This is not connected to like um, a chastisement on tithing. This is not connected to a giving campaign. There is a fundamental and real truth in us being a blessing and receiving blessing. However, on the flip side of that, we got to own this. When we withhold, it says the word poverty. Like it doesn't say like you, you might lose some sleep over it. You might feel a little bit of conviction in your heart. It's like, Candy gonna stop flowing. Big question. <laughs> what are you holding on to that you currently possess or seeking desperately to attain that's actually greed in disguise? Because see, the thing is, you never see that weed growing. You just see it full grown and you now gotta figure out what to do with it. Does not make you a bad person to say, you know what, if I'm honest, this is where I see greed show up in my life in a really insidious and creepy way just means that you're human. Greed is a piece of the condition of the human heart. It's something that the enemy's gonna sneak in and do while you're sleeping and you have no idea how it got there, when it showed up, but you just see it as a monster full grown staring you in the face. And it is your privilege, honor, responsibility, duty to figure out how you're going to address it. Is it just wanting that promotion and pure ambition, which is cool, like that's honorable, that's really good. You should seek advancement, right? Or is there the weed of greed growing in your lawn somewhere in that heart of yours that's like, you know what, really? It's because I've always felt like I was like a little too little and like if I could just boss up, I could be the big dog. Like this would be the thing that would validate me. Is it uh, really just, I'm just, you know, growing my online platform and presence as part of the marketing scheme. Like, that's cool. It probably is. Like, you, you probably have genuine, earnest intentions behind it. But is there that little creepy weed in there somewhere of greed, somewhere in your heart where you would say, I've always kind of felt like I just wasn't enough. And now I'm going to prove my enoughness by the amount of likes and the amount of public validation I can get to soothe this private itch for attention that I have. There are some really respectable longings that I feel for you if you go through, like longing for a spouse and like, how long do I gotta live this life being single? I want that companion, that mate, that person to travel with, that person to marry, that person to be in relationship with forever, that person to have kids with. And this is all good, well-meaning, earnest stuff, saying it with no judgment, but is this this honorable desire and intention, or is there maybe this seed planted of greed in there where it's like, no, 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 my way on my timing and got to look like this and be like this and have that job and have this level of income. And maybe God's like, yo, I had this other thing for you in my perfect timing, which would have been better for you. We've got to ask ourselves these questions, get curious, not with the burden of condemnation, but only in conviction. Where is it in your garden, friends, where you didn't plant the seed, you didn't ask for it, you didn't want it, but this weed is popping up of greed? It's always going to wear a mask. It's always going to look like something different. It's always going to look like, I'm just preaching the word of God, but am I building my own platform while I do it? It's a really fun story about my lawn. We're going to continue this whole dad theme here. Um, <laughs> I was doing a selfie video one time to invite people to my kid's birthday party. And I'm seeing as I look in front of me on the screen, the scene behind me. And let me tell you, my lawn was dead, dead. Like embarrassing. I'm like, I am not posting this video. We're going to go in the house and record something different. Matter of fact, wifey, we need to rearrange this thing. No bounce house outside. Mm -mm, close the blinds. I was embarrassed about what our lawn looked like that I hadn't realized. Our lawn was a hay field. Our lawn didn't look lush and green. It looked like the carpet at the Story Church, okay? <laughs> it was like straight up khaki. I used to rock this, this, um, this dad hat. It was like a, like a bucket hat style, you know, keep the sun out of your face. And it was awesome. And it was khaki. And I remember literally looking at the lawn and taking off my hat and looking at it and being like, this is a problem. So we'll talk about how I dealt with weeds and things like that that were popping up in the lawn. But first, I want to just address this. There was greed in this whole situation from the start, which I didn't see at the moment. And maybe through my story, it helps you to explore your own story about where greed could be creeping in. 
we had a really insanely high water bill one month. And we were like, that's it. We're blaming it on water in the grass. I'm shutting the, the sprinkler system off. It was a bigger issue we didn't even know about. Now notice greed wasn't, I got to go apply for this job that's not even in my field because it pays well, or I got to um, sell everything we own on offer up so I can have money to buy this really cool thing. It wasn't agreed for more. It was actually agreed for like protecting what we already have and agreed for a little bit less like, oh no, we got to stop this issue of a $1,200 water bill. Yeah, it got that real. It was shocking. Now, little did I know there was a small leak, a little tiny dripping leak that you couldn't see from the naked eye, but an expert would have been able to see real quickly. And this leak on our pipes, when I later did the right thing and got curious and welcomed wisdom and asked somebody who's certified in that field to come look at it, I learned that for a cool 120 bucks, I could have solved this problem forever and kept my grass green. But this greed, this grasping for gain, this wanting for more, this longing for, you know, just in a closed-minded, defensive, committed to being right, this below-the-line thinking, I was like, oh, I got the answer. We're fixing all this. I'm just not going to water my grass. Grass goes dead. Now, what's funny is, as I started to be this YouTube geek and spend all my nights and weekends studying what other dads around the world are doing to revive their dead and gone lawns, I got all these different stories about how to get the grass to grow again and then what to do when the weeds are coming up through that grass. And I came to find that when my grass wasn't quite green yet, I did start to see little bits of green life coming up every now and then. When I would use my little handy dandy app, praise God for technology, that identifies plants, I would find out like, yo, that's not grass, that's crabgrass. Like, that's a weed. I hear some murmurs of laughter in the room. You have dealt with crabgrass before. Crabgrass kind of sort of can look like grass, even has grass in the name. It's kind of one of those things, like, I know this is no good for my lawn, but, like, if we're having guests over straight up, I don't want to remove that because, like, at least something's green. <laughs> How has greed showed up like that in your life? I'm kind of dealing with this whole checking of the ego, but I got to slide in the story of that accolade and that thing I did because, like, so, at least something in my life looks a little bit greener for public view. And so one of the things that I read was like, you got to pull all the weeds. You got to get in there and you got to get them out of there. But another thing I read that really stuck with me was be patient with those weeds. Grow a healthy lawn around those weeds because when you get more nutrient-dense soil that is feeding the roots of healthy grass around it, it's going to literally choke those weeds out and you have less to remove in the beginning to begin with. But then when you do remove them, there's a process for removing them. Don't just go spraying some cheap weed killer you need to get in there and pull it up from the root. And then one thing that stuck with me that I noticed as I honored this process was that I would go and pull some roots and some, you can just get them right out of there. Others, you had to really do some digging. Some were so stubborn, you had to drench it with a water hose, get the ground sopping wet, go in with a shovel, do all this work and pull these roots out. There was this really unattractive truth that I discovered unhealthy things in my lawn had established some really healthy root systems. We're talking weed one foot tall, roots two feet long. Big old nasty gangly cords, fibrous members, arms and legs. These roots were gnarly. And I realized in that, that we can treat the, sy the symptom, right? I can just get the weed off my lawn and it looks gone, like it's low enough, the grass is at the same level, we're good or I can treat the system underlying it under the ground. I don't wanna just chop off the fruit, I need to get to the root. And some things that find themselves in our lives that we didn't ask for, and that frankly, it's not your fault that it's there. It's your responsibility to remove, and you can find out that it has really healthy roots, even as it's an unhealthy thing. Like, let's just say, you know, Becky at your job, she got the promotion you wished for and you got laid off. And no offense if you're here today and your name is Becky, this is just a, a story. In the first service, it was Sheila. You get laid off. You were dreaming for a promotion. Becky gets that promotion you longed for. Let's just say this is a weed in the garden and you're looking to get rid of it. You might do one of two things. You might say, you know what? I'm going to go give her a talking to because I don't appreciate how she took what was mine. Or you might do the thing that's more common. It's more human nature. Like, you know what? I don't know how to deal with that situation. It's kind of awkward. I'm feeling some really complicated feelings. So, I'm just 
not going to address it. I just, I'm cutting Becky off. That did not get to the root. This thing had some really deep, well-established roots that brought it to life. And it's trying to produce seeds to bring other things to life and to reproduce. That didn't get to the root. This thing wasn't about Becky. This thing wasn't even about the job. It wasn't really ultimately about the promotion. It was about the fact that you just wanted to feel like you were good enough. And why am I always overlooked? And why do people jockey for position and push me to the side? Why didn't the boss see me? Are my talents and gifts even respected or appreciated here? There's this longing for more and this void that needed to be filled. The roots were so much deeper. Crabgrass, that weed I was talking about a little bit earlier, I learned that in its lifetime, it produces 150,000 seeds. One plant produces enough seeds that if every one of them got a seat at NRG Stadium, it would fill that sucker up two and a half times. One thing in your life that's not supposed to be there could choke out the good in your life and take over your whole lawn. Ouch. As I was thinking about this, I thought about some of the situations where we can have well-meaning things that we're trying to pursue that have that seed of greed in them. Like there are things in our life that other people would commend and give us props for and give us credit for and would even praise us for. And they get on our social media channels and say, yo, that's hashtag goals. And then you know in your heart that it's actually hashtag greed. Jesus talks about this. And this is so cool. I'm just gonna let you into my, my sermon preparation process a little bit. It always starts with a God thought. God will put something on my heart will inspire me to share something. There will always be a gospel connection to it. And I was already feeling like, man, that story about the weeds and removing them and how much that was just like this thankless job and it was so hard, but I had to commit to it because I had to get a bad thing out to let the good thing in. Man, that thing is just, that's gonna bless somebody. But then as I go into my quiet time and I study in preparation to now speak on it, a really incredible thing came to my recognition. This is in Matthew 13. Jesus teaches two back-to-back parables, one about weeds and the next about seeds. Here's where it begins. Matthew 13, 24 through 32, and I'll read it. It'll be on the screens as well, but I'll read this out word for word from the NIV so you can follow along with me. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, you want us to go in and pull them up? Good intentions. No, he answered, because while you're pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I'll tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them up in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Parable of the mustard seed and the yeast. He then told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, when it grows, it's the largest of the garden plants. It becomes a tree so that the birds come in and perch in its branches. There's something so special about finding the things that we didn't plant there, that are an elephant in the room, that we don't necessarily want to talk about, that are insidious and creepy and find their way in through one place, but they can spread to 150,000 different places and how we need to get to them and uproot them. But first, honor the harvest. Let the good in. Let the light in if you feel like you're entering into a dark place to choke that thing out But then when you remove it, you might need gloves because that thing is spiky. You might need a shovel because that thing is deep. You might need water because that ground is hard. And when you really get those unhealthy roots out of it, when you've treated not just the symptom that's above ground, but the system that's below ground, now what happens in this barren wasteland of ground? You don't just want a dirt divot in your lawn. There's got to be a sowing of a new seed in that place. So I got to thinking about what kind of seed do we want to sow? Pull a weed, sow a seed. Sounds fancy, fun pastoral talk, something that's, you know, great for your notes. I mean, I didn't even title this message, but this, that's a great one. Pull a weed, sow a seed. That's awesome. That's hashtagable. 
what seed do we need to plant? The early Christian believers who established this list of seven deadly sins said that charity would be a solution for greed. Makes a lot of sense, right? Like if I'm giving stuff away, I'm clearly not wanting for more stuff unless I'm using this to feed that, right? Charity, or let's just give it a G name, fit it right on in with the fancy sermon situation we got here. Let's call it generosity. Generosity is great. Generosity is beautiful. Generosity is noble. Jesus never once teaches in the Bible that generosity is bad. He celebrates generosity. He calls and compels us toward the cause of being generous people. It's peace. It's a foundational piece to what we profess to believe and practice in our faith. But what if generosity is carried out with wayward motives? How many times have you seen somebody giving and then filming that giving to share the story of their giving? Or let's take it even bigger and broader. Out of the goodness of my heart, because God blessed me with so much, I'm gonna give millions of dollars to this accredited and respected educational institution it's in the contract, you gotta name the building after me. How many times do we see these things creep into our lives, creep into our hearts and find a way to turn a noble thing into a miscarried and abused thing for the cause of greed? I was giving away some stuff at Goodwill one time. And I'll be honest, this stuff was like junk to me. And I just wanted to clear out the garage. And so I go to give it, cause I'm like, I'm feeling really noble about that, right? Like, this is good. I'm not just throwing it away. I'm, taking it to donate and somebody else can use it later. And in all honesty, it's like, I have no need for this stuff, but I'm feeling all these feelings like I'm just being such a good person in my giving. And then they came out after I donated all this stuff with this tax deduction form that nobody's gonna fact check. Nobody knows what I report on it. This is an opportunity to totally lie about how much I gave and then keep a, a you know, I gotta keep the yellow copy of that man because it's for tax purposes. I could get myself out of a world of financial trouble if I wanted to miscarry this thing. There's a heart for generosity and then there's greed that could potentially underlie it. So we have to assess our motives. Let me ask this question. Could you give enough to your church or give enough to somebody that it could solve the issue of greed in your heart? Or do we maybe use our giving a good, well-intentioned thing to mask the greed? Like, I don't wanna deal with that. Like Monday through Saturday, I just want to do this good deed on Sunday. Matthew 23, 23 is really cool because Jesus steps on some toes. And you'll see the NIV translation of this verse popping up on the screen here. Jesus says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Ooh. Jesus Christ himself, like Christ, root word in Christian, like this is the man. Talking to teachers of the law and Pharisees, talking to people who live a life consecrated to the purposes of God and with the genuine intention, whether they're right or wrong and how they carry it out, of trying to honor God. He says, you hypocrites. He continues, why are they hypocrites? Jesus, please tell us, we'd like to know. You give a 10th of all your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Ouch. Why do we like half-truths in comfortable, convenient, fast food Christianity? Like it's cool to think it's good to give, so I just want to be a giver. But if we don't check these things that have crept into our hearts and are becoming a piece of the human condition, we stop right there. Jesus says, yeah, you should have done the former, but like, did you honor the latter? Like justice, mercy, faithfulness. Can your giving mask and account for what you're not doing that could fully honor God and living a life in submission to his will? It's a big one for us to chew on. I thought of this other um, greed killer that we could spray, kill, this, kill all this greed in the lawn of our life. And it was gratitude. Now, I want to lead with this. Let's celebrate gratitude for a moment. Because like generosity, it's a thing where when Jesus teaches on it, he says, he doesn't ever tell you not to do it. He just says, do it, but understand that's not going to cover up the things that I see in your heart that we still got to deal with. Gratitude's amazing. So 
if we were to look at philosophy and we were to look at psychology and we were to look at just the voices of our day that would speak to this thing, they would tell us that the human heart and mind can only fully feel one emotion at one time, right? So when you feel grateful for what you have, you're not greedy for what you don't have. Seeds of bitterness cannot take root in a grateful heart. I think about things like Thanksgiving. So uh, my people, African-Americans, what we do is we get one too many plates and then we're sleepy. We call that the itis. I don't know what you call it. We call that the itis. Now, let me tell you, when I'm feeling the itis, when I've eaten so much that I'm uncomfortable no matter how I sit and it's time to take a nap while the football game watches me, the last thing I want to do is go take food off somebody else's plate. Gratitude does have that power to do it. Gratitude brings fulfillment. Gratitude brings joy. Gratitude brings you to a place of like, I'm good with what I got, and I don't want to take what they got. But gratitude unchecked can be a problem. Author Greg McCune, who wrote one of my favorite books of all time, Essentialism, says this about gratitude. When we focus on what we lack, we lose what we have. When we focus on what we have, we gain what we lack. Gratitude is a superpower. It turns whatever we have into enough. That's big. So we got to celebrate gratitude. Gratitude does some pretty cool things for us, right? I love the way he starts it. When we focus on what we lack, we lose what we have. Um, <laughs> I know a guy who says, when you mess up your for show money looking for some more money, you end up with no money. <laughs> <laughs> gratitude is so wonderful. But I think we've all seen examples of how it can be miscarried. It's just such a human thing, right? Like our hearts are so filthy. Like, let's be real. The Bible teaches us we've all fallen short of glory. We've all missed the mark. So why even play games with it? Why fake the funk? Why act like we can do enough good, achieve our way out of our problems? We got to deal with the darkest parts of our hearts. We've all seen gratitude be miscarried. I think about like watching the Academy Awards and how people are up there with the fancy trophy and on the stage under the bright lights. And, you know, of course they're going to thank everybody. And that's great. Like, you got humility. You got the right intentions. Like, that's awesome. But what if there's that air of cockiness? What if there's that, you know, I'm so great. Look at me, and I'm beautiful tonight, and everybody loves me, and this is going to be so good for my bank account. And uh, by the way, thank you to all the little people. Mom, labor must have really been terrible. Thank you. Uh, and to my assistant and to the person who got me coffee every day, you can't thank enough people to solve the fact that you're ungrateful and constantly grasping for more and seeking more advancement. Nothing is ever enough. The insatiable itch for more is what greed is. And it can show up in the lawn of our life in so many different ways. So if it's not generosity, if it's not gratitude, if these things can be miscarried, what is the thing that we sow? We do that hard work of pulling the weed. We still got to sow a seed. I find that there's something really amazing that happens when the generosity is rooted in gratitude and the position that puts our heart in. One thing that I really love about your pastor, Eric Huffman, is that we can get into some really long, rich theological conversations. And I sat with Eric and Kale and Rolando and Dylan, your incredible pastoral staff, and we really explored this thing. What then is the solution? It's gotta be something we're not seeing. We gotta really dig, dig in scripture and really question like how would we apply what we're, what we're hearing and what Jesus taught to this day, 2022, Houston, Texas. And it was really cool how we saw that when Generosity is rooted in gratitude. It puts you in a position of rest. Let me explain that. If I see a person who's experiencing homelessness and I feel compelled out of the goodness of my heart to give to them, I could also be compelled to make sure somebody knows I gave to them. And I can shroud it with all the best of motives and intentions. Like, this is good. I'm raising awareness. I want somebody else to be generous. Like, no, you want somebody else to like what you shared, right? Um, but what if I feel an overwhelming sense of the emotion of gratitude and I'm able to reconcile this experience, this compelling uh, that I feel toward giving by saying, I'm so grateful for all that God has given me. I'm willing to give, not just the extra dollar I found in the glove compartment that has a chocolate stain on it from my kids, but like from what was purposed for me, intended for me, that I had plans for, can I give that knowing that I can rest? I can trust in the sufficiency of Christ. Like everything I need is gonna be supplied, so why am I tripping? 
giving from a place of gratitude postures your heart in a place of rest. And that applies to everything, even me in this moment. If I can just be really vulnerable with you and just show you some of my weeds because I have no interest in them continuing to grow and produce new seeds in my life, so I gotta call them out and find them at the root, right? There, there is so much temptation when I'm in a study of the Bible to be like, ooh, that scripture is fire. I hope the haters are present today. So I'm gonna throw this at them and then what you gonna say now? Or man, this one's real good. And I think I got a funny feeling so-and-so is gonna attend. They need that. I need to put that out there for them. Hello. Or if I say it this way and put some sauce on it and like don't directly quote it from the Bible, but kind of put my own little interpretation on it, then like when the story church later cuts it, crops it and puts it on Instagram as an edit, like, yo, I'm gonna look like one of those celebrity pastors if I say it like that. There's a heart check because if the generosity is rooted in gratitude, it looks different. It's not, oh, that's a great scripture. I can't wait to share that. Ooh, this one's really good. It's powerful. This will fix that. Oh, this one fits the, that thing that they told me to talk on. This was my topic. So I got to make sure I do that. There's something different about taking in the word of God and saying, oh, God, you love me enough that you would put that into my life. I'm so grateful. This has changed me and grown me. and now. Out of, this place of gen- out of this place of gratitude, I can practice generosity in saying, what seeds have come from this harvest that I can plant in the life of others? Notice it brings me to a place of rest. Notice that if it's about me and mine and platform building, oh, I gotta get loud and I gotta make sure I'm clear and I gotta make sure you heard me. Oh, let me say it again and repeat it. If it's simply coming from a place of gratitude and well-founded in generosity, I can just say it sincerely in love to you, letting you know I'm nothing but a mouthpiece. Rest is a funny thing to say in a community like Houston, Texas, fourth largest city in the world, bustling industry, right? My question for us is this. If we keep showing up to trade our time for money on a job, when do we ever actually like celebrate the Sabbath rest? like that good rest, like there's a whole day, we do nothing, right? Look at God in the story of creation, seven days of making stuff, six days he clocked in, one day he clocked out. Like when are we gonna find that time and say, I'm going to be generous with my time to the people I am most grateful for by not trading my time for something that could give me gain? It's big. Talked in the intro a little bit about how I have a fitness background. One of the things that I enjoy to do most is working with professional athletes. And one of the guys I work with, he's currently a top contender in the UFC. This guy is a savage. He's an incredibly gifted elite athlete and he performs really well. But we do some conditioning work, but we also do some mindset work. And what I find is that there's two dueling mindsets in an athlete, which I think we wrestle with ourselves as well. There's an ownership mindset and there's a stewardship mindset. And when he finds himself in an ownership mindset, I don't have a team, I'm one man, I'm locked in a cage, mano y mano, somebody's getting put to sleep and I pray tonight, it's not me. Like I need my body to do more. I need to get more reps, I need to be more precise, I need to do more practice. Hey coach, did we drill enough on this? We gotta drill on this thing. Hey, can I get you for an extra day because we really gotta focus on the fundamentals of this piece of the game. I really gotta tighten up this piece of my strategy. There's all this work, 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 this constant doing. The, um, The motive is not greed. The motive is I wanna make sure I'm as prepared as possible. But watch this, the three core tenets of strength and conditioning, input, output, rest. Eat clean to fuel your body, go perform and challenge your body, rest your body so you can come back at it sharper the next day. What we found is that when he shifts into a stewardship mindset, I don't own this body and I have the obligation to take care of this body. Then we find, oh, you're not primed to sustain a knockout, you're primed to deal a knockout. When you do, by routine, every single night for eight hours, get knocked out. You need to let the rest. It's funny how a savage UFC fighter does his best work when he just plays with his daughter more, when he just gets better date nights with his wife, when he just gets full nights of sleep. And so my question for us in 2022 in Houston, Texas, is when will we ever cross the street from I got to do this and it's honorable and intention. I got to do this and it's with the right motive. I got to do this, but my heart is to please God. Jesus was talking to us 
Like, yeah, teachers of the law. Like, yeah, people who are committed to the cause of advancing God's kingdom. Cool. I get it. Your motives are good. But there's something in your blind side, like uh, along the fence line where the sun don't shine. There's this weed coming up. What are you doing about it? When will we ever come to the place where we say, you know what? Because I'm grateful to the right source and generous for the right reasons, my heart is settling into a place of rest, a good rest, a righteous rest, a rest that is founded on trust and trust more specifically in the sufficiency of Christ to supply every need. I wanna pray for us this morning. Lord, thank you for this word. Thank you for the way that it challenged me. Thank you for the blessing and honor it was this morning to share it with the story fam. Thank you for helping us define the things in our life that we didn't plant, that we're not responsible for coming in, but that we now have to address as the elephant in the room and find ways to curiously welcome wisdom in to rid ourselves of. Thank you for helping us to examine after we get these things out, what to put in. And I just speak a blessing. I speak favor over everybody present today. And I just declare that these hearts here in the Story Church are fertile ground, good ground, where when you scatter your seed, even something as small as a mustard seed, it brings forward vibrant, lush, green, thriving, life renewed. Thank you, and I love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <laughs>